So uh, I have started in the morning to talk about this uh, topological condo effect, which happens if we have more than two Majorana bound states on a floating superconductor. And in that case, we have a quantum impurity spin degree of freedom, non-locally encoded by the Majorana states. And this spin then talks by exchange-like coupling processes uh, to normal leads. So you get a screening, just like in the conventional spin one-half condo effect, where you have a spin one-half magnetic impurity coupled by exchange coupling to uh, metallic electrons or the spin of uh, metal electrons and then there is a screening phenomenon at low temperatures uh, the spin is completely screened off by the, uh, by the uh, uh, surrounding electrode or metal. Now here uh, in this case uh, it turns out that this is a more complicated a more exotic uh, kind of condo effect it's of the overscreened multi-channel uh, type and that is a as a non-fermi liquid uh, uh, fixed point so such uh, local non-fermi liquids are not so uh, uh, often found in in nature because they're typically unstable against anisotropies here uh, one finds it's stable intrinsically stable and we will discuss why and uh, the prediction is that one should be able to see this in uh, electric conductance measurement and that would indeed be a non-local manifestation of these Majorana fermions that uh, would be very nice to see uh, in experiments. So here again this picture uh, we have a superconductor deposited on top of it are uh, N uh, nanowires each of them here has a pair of Majorana fermions so in that picture N is 6 M the number of Majorana fermions can be up to 2n, and we just count those that are connected to leads. So these five here would be connected in that case. The minimal example where it's interesting is m equal to 3, when we have just three Majorana fermions coupled to leads. If we have just two, as we discussed, uh, we, have a, uh, we have no ground state degeneracy. This is the Majorana single charge transistor that I also discussed in the morning. So uh, the ground state degeneracy I explained is 2 to the n minus 1 if we have n wires and uh, that comes because for each wire we have a twofold degeneracy in the ground state sector. This is this even odd parity uh, effect but then we have an overall parity constraint because for strong charging energy the charge of the island is fixed and so um, in total this charge on the island uh, is some integer number and the parity of this number is inherited by our uh, Majorana degrees of freedom. So there's a parity constraint uh, that one has to satisfy. Um. Okay, we have then continued uh, uh, with a description of the leads. These were one-dimensional Dirac uh, fermions on the half line, which is equivalent to Dirac fermions only Dirac fermions on the full line. And uh, we have used abelian bosonization, which you have just heard from uh, um, Giuseppe, as a convenient description of one-dimensional fermions in terms of bosons. So in that uh, framework, you write the uh, electron uh, annihilation operator for right or left moving electron in terms of a dual pair of phase fields, exponential of this. And then there are Klein factors and these Klein factors are Majorana fermions again. Yeah? And that's technically very uh, nice because then we can get rid of uh, basically the whole fermionic content of the theory. So the leads are just Gaussian theory, like what you just saw. These are free fermions, central charge one, or M, if you have M copies of it. And uh, we can even include electron-electron interactions in the leads in this parameter G. G equal 1 is the non-interacting case. And we saw that we have directly boundary conditions for the theta field related to the charge. Exactly, then we, we went on and uh, looked at the tunnel Hamiltonian. The tunnel Hamiltonian here, here we get uh, exactly these parity products of Majorana and, and this Klein Majorana fermion. And since this is a conserved quantity and can be gauged away, we can get rid of the whole fermionic sector and have a purely bosonic problem in terms of these phase fields uh, of the leads. Yeah? So um, 
this phi here is the superconducting phase field on the island. And we have m of these phase fields at the position of the contact. Yeah, these are our degrees of freedom now. And uh, we can actually integrate out all the bosonic fields away from this point. It's a Gaussian theory. You can always integrate over Gaussian functions. And uh, in the relevant zero winding sector, also the phi field, after shifting it away from here, is Gaussian. And you can also integrate this away. And then we have a purely bosonic action just for these phi j of tau fields, tau being imaginary time. Yeah, so this was the tunneling. And here we have a dissipative action. And the important point is that the total phase field, uh, so phi 1 plus uh, phi 2 and so on, this mode is conjugate to the charge on the island. But the charge on the island is pinned by the charging energy, which means the conjugate field widely fluctuates. This is exactly this Q equal to zero mode here. And one sees from this expression on energies below the charging energy, this mode becomes a free mode. So it fluctuates wildly. And that is exactly uh, uh, a manifestation of strong charging effects. It, will, uh, it implies that tunneling onto the island must be followed within a time of order 1 over EC by tunneling out. But you can tunnel out in whatever lead you want. Yeah? This was this, uh, this picture here. So on energy scales above EC, you can forget EC, and it's resonant on wave reflection fix, uh, physics. But then as you go below EC, charging effects kick in, and they bind in and out tunneling effects together. Yeah? And in fact, uh, the relevant uh, amplitude for such uh, dipoles is given as Tj, Tk over EC. We could give a QCD analogy, but the important point is this action here. So at low energy scales below the charging energy, we have a dissipative action. And we have here something that looks like a periodic potential. So we can interpret that as a quantum Brownian motion picture for a particle that has coordinates phi 1, phi 2, and so on. So it has a, it's an m-dimensional space. It's moving subject to ohmic dissipation with dissipation uh, strength g. That's the interaction parameter in the leads. And it moves in this periodic potential that we will see corresponds to a hypertriangular lattice in, in m dimensions. Yeah? And there are coupling constants here. So that's a well-defined bosonic action for which you can uh, uh, compute correlation functions and so on, just like... Uh, uh uh, Giuseppe showed us, and it's, uh, in fact, by using operator product expansion, you can immediately uh, derive these one-loop RG equations. So how do these couplings flow when I start to integrate over uh, small energy shells and reduce the, the energy scale from EC downward? And one sees these lambdas have one term that tends to decrease them, this is this first term, and one term that tends to increase them, provided the number uh, of uh, Majoranas is bigger than 2. Yeah, because this index M must be different from J and K, and J and K also need to be different from each other. So this is only possible if you have more than uh, two uh, summation terms in this sum. And then, uh, indeed, this uh, is, a, is a term that tends to increase. Yes, please. Oh, density of states. That's the lead density of states, just one over the Fermi velocity. So the first term is just something that comes from Luttinger liquid physics. So if we have non-interacting leads, this is just gone. And this is the one that generically drives you to strong coupling. Yeah? And uh, we discussed there is this intermediate fixed point, uh, which you only have if you have interactions. Without interactions, it moves to zero. So let's just discuss the non-interacting case here. So for g equal to 1, we are always in this phase that the initial couplings are above this, uh, this critical point. And then the RG flow is always towards strong coupling. And in fact, it proceeds in a way such that it becomes more and more isotropic. So these lambda j, k become more and more equal to approach this line uh, here. So you can also show this analytically. All anisotropies die out in this process uh, of the RG flow. 
and in fact, that will um, imply the stability of the condo fixed point because intrinsically all these anisotropies are uh, suppressed. Now the RG fails uh, as you hit an uh, energy scale called the condo temperature, and the name condo already tells you that uh, we can expect condo physics here. And that's nice as seen uh, for G equal to 1 by going back to this action and re fermionize it. Yeah? So now you can introduce fermions again by going the other way from bosons to fermions. And the result uh, is the following Hamiltonian. Here I use the unfolded language. So here we have the M leads. It's going from minus infinity to infinity. So we have here a Dirac fermion, just a right mover for each uh, lead. It couples at x equal to zero, so it's a local impurity coupling, to an uh, object SJK here. This SJK are the Majorana bilinears. So SJK is antisymmetric if you exchange J and K. It's just uh, the product of gamma J, gamma K. The I here makes this a Hermitian object. And uh, in fact, you can check easily if, uh, if you take the commutation relations of SJK with SLM, you will find it obeys the uh, group relations of SOM symmetry. So it, unlike a, a usual spin, which obeys SU2 algebra, this obeys the SOM algebra. So SO means special orthogonal. And uh, unitary is usually associated with complex numbers, orthogonal with real numbers. You can rationalize that because Majorana fermions are real. Gamma is equal to gamma dagger, which means they are really real. And this reality condition uh, turns uh, the special unitary group into the orthogonal symmetry. And so these are the components of our spin. Yeah? So that's the, the algebra we will see for m equals 3 that we can even express it in terms of Pauli matrices. I'll give that on the next slide. So that's the general formulation. These are the spin components. Looks a bit uh, unusual because usually we have a vector of Sx, Sy, Sz. But for m bigger than 3 or for this SOM, you need uh, actually uh, tensors or, or matrices. Yeah? And we see now this SJK couples to a combination of different leads, Psi J dagger 0, Psi K 0. Yeah? And here I already assumed isotropic couplings because we know from the RG it flows to isotropy. Now again, gamma J and gamma K are at different points in space. So we have a non-local realization of this quantum impurity spin. And in fact, this non-locality is also linked to stability later on. You can also write uh, the Psi, the Dirac fermion, as a Majorana mu plus I Xi, another Majorana. Yeah, this you can always do. This has central charge one half, this has central charge one half, the Dirac has cen central charge one. So that's fine. And uh, you, you then get uh, simply, this is a transpose because we have now M copies of this, so you have now mu dx mu plus xi dx xi for, for the free Hamiltonian. And now the coupling to the impurity looks like that. You have a mu of zero s mu, and then the same for xi. So you have a two-channel SOM condo model. Yeah? There are two Majorana channels in the leads that couple to the same impurity. So eventually, both channels get coupled together because of this coupling to uh, the spin operator. So that's rather abstract. Let me make it a bit more uh, concrete by switching to m equal 3. SO3 is closely linked to SU2. So you might expect that we can find a spin one half representation. And indeed, instead of the SJK here, I can, for this case, define a quantum impurity spin operator as usual with components SX, SY, SZ by taking uh, here with the epsilon tensor these products. So for instance, Sx will be something like I uh, gamma uh, 2 gamma 3, yeah? and so on cyclic permutations. So these products of three Majoranas, they realize essentially spin one half uh, algebra. You can check this beast here, obeys the standard spin algebra, commutator of S1 with S2 is I S3 and cyclic permutations which means you can represent this beast here in terms of standard Pauli matrices. Yeah, it's a spin one half degree of freedom. So for m equals 3, we have a spin one half degree of freedom. 
and three leads. Three spinless leads means we have one lead with spin one. Spin one has uh, directions minus one, zero, and one. Yeah? So you have a spin one half talking to a spin one. That means it is an overscreened condo effect. So the screening is over complete. You don't have enough spin at the impurity to catch up with the spin in the, in the lead. Yeah? In the normal condo effect, you have a spin one half talking to spin one half. And then a perfect screening is, is possible and you get local Fermi liquid behavior as encoded in Nozier's famous uh, theory. In this case, since there is no uh, perfect compensation possible, one gets um, a residual ground state degeneracy. So there's some object remaining even in the ground state. You cannot completely quench it, so there will be some residual ground state degeneracy and a local non-Fermi liquid behavior. Yeah, that's generally found for overscreened multi-channel condo effect. Yeah, so this is multi-channel condo physics, and uh, we can now see how can we get this out of this bosonized uh, description. So uh, again, we take this action as I it's the same action I showed you before, and now we want to see what happens as we go below the condo temperature. The RG equations we cannot use anymore, they were perturbative. But what we can see from this, what happens if lambda grows and grows. Then, of course, these fields will try to get pinned into the minima of this potential. Yeah? So we have quantum Brownian motion in a periodic potential. This potential is like a hyper triangular lattice. And we have a particle with this coordinate phi. Okay, so at lambda to infinity, of course, you want to freeze these. Uh, at the positions where you really uh, lock the uh, at, at the position of the minima of this potential. But you have to be careful because here the isotropic phase field mode is decoupled. Yeah? You can shift each of these fields by a constant. It's basically the sum of the phi's doesn't appear anymore here. That's the free, fully fluctuating mode. So the lambda only affects the m minus 1 orthogonal modes, orthogonal to this uh, isotropic field. And for these modes here, you get then a flow uh, from Neumann to Dirichlet boundary conditions. So at low energy scales, close to the ground state, all these fields, these m-1 modes are pinned. So the dual charge fields, the theta fields, will instead of a Neumann conditions. And then these are the good degrees of freedom you should work with. And uh, physically, what, uh, what the dominant low energy processes are, technically speaking, the leading irrelevant operators, uh, these are instant on transitions between the minima of this potential. So you have different minima in this periodic potential, and then you have to look for the nearest neighbor minima, and then there are tunneling processes that connect these two minima. These are called instantons. And uh, by evaluating these instantons, you can identify what are the leading uh, processes around this ground state. So that means one has to switch to the dual boson theory. So instead of working with the phi field near strong coupling limit, near zero temperature, it's better to work with the uh, charge uh, boson field, which is canonically conjugate to our phi field. Yeah, so this will obey Neumann conditions near strong coupling, and we only need the components perpendicular to this isotropic Q mode. That means we have a constraint uh, that sum, the sum over these theta J fields is just locked to zero. That's exactly the charge pinning. Yeah? These are uh, charge fields, so the charge is pinned by the strong charging energy. Now, doing this uh, uh, dual boson theory uh, leads you again to a Gaussian fixed point action. So you have simply the same as before with G going to 1 over G. And now the leading irrelevant perturbations come from instanton transitions. That's a bit too technical to show it here. You find uh, uh, that uh, you generate leading irrelevant terms that look like this. Cosine of 2 theta J. W is the instanton uh, amplitude, so e to the minus the action of this instanton trajectory. This quantity goes to zero as lambda goes to infinity. Yeah, so as the, the well goes deeper and deeper, the, the instanton transition amplitude becomes smaller and smaller. So that's our leading irrelevant perturbation, and you can check that the scaling dimension of this beast 
is given by this formula. So it's 2g times 1 minus 1 over m. And this number here is always bigger than 1 unless we make the interactions in the leads very strong. So it's always irrelevant. Scaling dimension means basically how the decay of this operator, uh, or correlation functions of this operator decay asymptotically. And in the renormalization group framework, you simply can read often this, this number from this exponent here and uh, of course taking into account this constraint. And then you find precisely that number and that will enter all exponents for power law corrections later on. So technically speaking, when this number is bigger than one, this operator will scale to zero as we go to the ground state, as we go to zero energy. If it's less than one, it will increase. Yeah? So now we, with this uh, dual boson theory, you can uh, nicely compute transport properties also at very low temperature and very low voltage, below Tk, below this condo temperature. You can also do this in a non-equilibrium Keldish uh, version and you can include source fields to read out currents and so on. I just give you here the results. So the most important one is probably the linear conductance. And that's here a tensor because we have m different leads. So we can probe the current through lead number j as it responds to a change in chemical potential in some different lead or in the same lead, uk. Yeah? And so that will be a tensor, and we evaluate it in the linear response regime where all the chemical potentials are equal. So that's this GJK, and the result is given here. It's 2E squared over H, then there is a 1 minus a temperature-dependent factor, and now here's a completely isotropic uh, matrix. Yeah? And that's remarkable because you start out with a model that has a, some arbitrary uh, tunnel matrix elements, in the ground state, the prediction is it flows to an isotropic multi-terminal junction. So all these matrix elements uh, uh, ch just depend whether J is equal to K or J is different from K. That's it. Temperature-dependent corrections scale with a power law. And you see here the scaling dimension that we just discussed of the leading irrelevant appears. And we see even for non-interacting leads, so when you have G equal to 1, then you have 2 minus 2 over m. That's always a non-integer quantity when m is bigger than 2. So you have always non-integer exponent up here, and that means that you have a non-Fermi liquid. Yeah? Fermi liquid would give you t square corrections. Non-Fermi liquid has some uh, uh, strange power laws up there, and these power laws depend on this number m, how many uh, Majorana fermions you uh, have in that system. Let's uh, have a look at GJJ, so at the diagonal conductance at zero temperature now. So at the diagonal conductance GJJ, uh, it's basically the, what we probed in this resonant Andreev reflection experiment, it's just the conductance through contact J. If you take the formula I just gave you, uh, put zero temperature, you find this result here. So it's 2e squared over H times 1 minus 1 over M. This is clearly bigger than e square over h, but smaller than 2 e square over h. So it's less than the resonant Andreev reflection case, but bigger than the teleportation case. It's something in between, and it, it explicitly depends on this number m. So you can think about this like some correlated Andreev reflection. It's some mixture, and uh, the, the nice thing is, if you can measure this, and just remove, say, for m equal 5, you get uh, 1 minus 1 fifth, 4 fifth uh, in units of 2e square over h. Now you remove one lead, and, and of course not the one where you want to measure, but then the prediction is you should gain again have a condo effect, but now that this conductance should change to 1 minus 1 over 4, to 3 fourth. Yeah? So this would be uh, an unambiguous uh, signature of this type of uh, non-locality due to Majorana fermions and uh, non-locality. And moreover, of course, you have these non-Fermi liquid power law corrections at finite temperature. Of course, you can also play similar games out of equilibrium, away from the linear response regime, uh, by looking at, for instance, the Fano factor, so shot noise, or by looking at the uh, backscattering corrections to the current as a function of voltage. Yeah? 
And there you find the same power laws and uh, isotropic uh, tensors in short noise, so current-current fluctuations. You again find uh, such tensors and it turns out that this and the current is linked by a Fano factor, so it's just a universal uh, proportionality constant, which here has different value than the SUN analogon. So this was this part four. Uh, we have discussed this topological condo effect with uh, stable non-Fermi liquid behavior. As a uh, uh, final part, uh, I will discuss a few recent, more recent developments. Uh, first one will be to discuss the dynamics of this residual impurity degree of freedom that uh, we have near the strong coupling fixed point of this condo uh, uh, effect. Uh, the second one will deal with what happens if we also couple the island to a bulk superconductor by Josephson effect. We will see that this allows for a manifold of non-Fermi liquid states, it's something even more exotic. And then at the end I will uh, make some advertisement for the talk of Stefan Blucke uh, in the workshop that follows after this, namely uh, on a Majorana surface code that you could uh, think of in terms of networks of interacting uh, Majorana fermions. Okay, so let's start with this uh, Majorana spin dynamics. So as I just argued, we have this overscreened multi-channel condo type fixed point where uh, a massively entangled effective impurity degree of freedom remains at strong coupling. Yeah? So we have a residual ground state entropy. And the question is, how could one see this? Is there any way to, to sort of uh, get access to that? And an obvious way is, of course, to think about Seemann fields. For a normal spin, you can talk to the spin by a Seemann field. So uh, can we write down something that looks like a Seemann field that couples to this SJK, so to the products of gamma J and gamma K? And now, of course, physically, these are just tunnel couplings between Majorana gamma J and Majorana gamma K. So these tunnel couplings, uh, describing the overlap of the Majorana wave functions, for instance, within the same nanowire, if the nanowire is not too long, they can be sizable, these act like Seemann fields in this business. Yeah? So these Seemann fields here are in, uh, contained in these uh, matrices H, J, K, that are also anti-symmetric, and uh, we can now uh, use these uh, couplings here, these tunnel couplings, that in principle could also be uh, changed by gate electrodes that will affect these couplings um, uh, and uh, think about how we could probe or manipulate such uh, Majorana bound states. Now first one needs uh, to see how this Majorana spin, this residual degree of freedom, uh, will look like in uh, bosonization. And, uh, that's actually not so trivial because now this Klein Majorana trick is spoiled by the couplings between uh, the different uh, uh, different Majoranas. So uh, what what we did here is to first derive a bosonized form of this uh, Majorana spin near the condo fixed point. It turns out it gets stressed by a factor that looks like this. So the dual uh, boson field enters here, and you have a cosine. So it's a dressing of the bare. Uh, a uh, Majorana spin, and this operator now has a scaling dimension that is less than one. So it is RG relevant, and that means that such couplings, uh, like the Seemann fields, are physically relevant. They are RG relevant, they drive you away from this condo fixed point. So eventually, of course, the condo effect is unstable against these couplings, but now it's a question how big these couplings are, because they will cause some crossover scale. This crossover scale you can estimate, for instance, if there's just one coupling between Majorana 1 and 2, it's given by this. And now if this coupling is very small against TK, it will be astronomically small. Yeah, so on uh, physically reachable temperatures, you still have your condo effect, but at the lowest temperatures, uh, of course, the Seemann field flows to strong coupling and will destroy this condo fixed point. In fact, it breaks, in a, in a sense, it's, it acts like a Seemann field, so it breaks some emergent time reversal symmetry. So the question is then what happens at uh, lower temperatures? So if the coupling is sizable, you can also reach it experimentally. 
at least in principle. So uh, the, the point is that we will then have a crossover between different condo fixed points, namely from SOM to SOM minus 2. Why is that? Uh, if we lower temperature below this uh, scale TH, in that case the Seyman coupling flows to strong coupling and then the two Majoranas, gamma 1 and gamma 2, they ba basically correspond to a fermion that lives at finite energy. Energy of scale H12, which is now a, a, a large scale. So that means these two disappear from the low energy sector. They don't participate anymore in this uh, low energy manifold and that means we have a, a, a condo effect with a reduced number of Majorana fermions only. So M minus 2, same scenario uh, can also be found from a bd ansatz solution in thermodynamic quantities. In the conductance we find uh, a behavior for instance like this. So again we assume here a single Seemann component H12 to be non-zero. And now we look at, for instance, G33. So it's some diagonal uh, conductance component different from 1 and 2. Yeah? So that's shown here in units of 2e square over h versus temperature. So as we go with temperature towards Tk, we approach the conductance 1 minus 1 over m for the SOM. Condo case, yeah? this is this correlated Andreev uh, 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 reflection uh, value. So this is here, but now as we come towards TH, there are perturbative uh, contributions from this. This is a relevant perturbation, so first you can still treat it in perturbation theory. Eventually perturbation free theory will of course break down. But uh, you can access it from this side using this insight that you are really at SOM minus 2. So this value here should just be 1 minus 1 over M minus 2. It's precisely this value. So the prediction is that you get the pronounced maximum at the temperature between uh, these two uh, scales. Yeah? And that's a crossover between these two non-Fermi liquid uh, states, SOM and SOM minus 2. Uh, a direct uh, time-dependent uh, probe could also reveal that we have non-trivial multipoint multi correlations at the condo fixed point. point. So for so instance, in the M equal 3 case, the simplest case, you get a three-point three correlation function that looks like this. this. So this is consistent with uh, conformal field theory, but this would not be present for SUN. Yeah? So that's a, a remarkable consequence of this residual uh, uh, degree of freedom uh, in this uh, topological condo effect. It implies that if you apply a time-dependent Seemann field, so that you have a time-dependent change on gate voltages that modulate your, oops, your tunnel. <laughs> it's a global breakdown of current. Should I just go on or, yeah, okay. <laughs> as long as this works, yeah. <laughs> So uh, uh, we have here a magnetic field uh, that we can sort of build out of these HKL uh, components. And if we have two frequencies and two components, uh, you can think of this as time-dependent gate voltage modulations of the tunnel couplings between the Majoranas. And in fact, you can measure in principle at least the magnetization, so the expectation values of these spins by uh, readout methods. The prediction is that if you have both these present, you will generate a, a magnetization, a time-dependent magnetization with the mixing frequencies, omega 1 plus or minus omega 2, uh, in the third component. So there is non-linear frequency mixing. And with just one component here, you generate transverse spin correlations, like Hall effect. Uh, you, uh, you get a correlator of S2 and S3 again with universal power law time dependencies. Yeah, so that would be a really uh, unique signature of this SOM uh, uh, impurity spin. Okay, so much about this first aspect and uh, I'll come now to the second one, namely what happens if we have here our device as uh, discussed so far, let's say with three Majoranas, coupled to normal leads, but now we have a Josephson coupling to some large bulk superconductor. So the 
Island Hamiltonian now includes on top of the charging energy, that's the term we always had so far, also Josephson coupling. Yeah? So uh, Josephson coupling uh, uh, gives you generally exactly this term with a Josephson energy EJ. This is also called topological Cooper pair box uh, and uh, if EJ is small against EC, you basically recover the physics we have discussed so far with some uh, uh, quantitative renormalizations. But uh, the more interesting case is here if EJ is uh, big against EC. Uh, so that's what I will discuss here in that case. You see that uh, then you can linearize or expand to quadratic order in the phase. Large EJ will lock the cosine uh, to one. So you expand, you get something like phi square. Here you have, uh, uh, here you have uh, NC square. Phi and NC are canonically conjugate, so you get something like an effective harmonic oscillator. Yeah? So in the limit that EJ is large against EC, such a system uh, charging plus uh, Josephson coupling is equivalent to a harmonic oscillator. The frequency is the plasma frequency omega square root 8 EJ EC. That's well known. So we have a harmonic oscillator here for the NC and uh, for the superconducting degree of freedom. And that means we can easily trace over these uh, phase fluctuations to uh, get a low energy theory. And one sees that these low, this low energy theory contains two uh, contributions. One is, uh, looks like a resonant and wave reflection, so sing single particle tunneling from each lead to the Majorana with some hopping amplitude Tj. And then there is a condo exchange coupling, again, uh, oh, relatively similar to what we had before, but now it's of a single channel SOM type. Namely, you have here Psi J dagger plus Psi J coupled to Psi K dagger plus Psi K. Before we had just these cross terms. Yeah? So that's a different uh, SO1M type condo effect, also of non Fermi liquid type, but slightly different from what I discussed before. This was, I think, first studied by Zwellig in a, a spin chain uh, model, but here you find the same uh, model also with a superconductor. This uh, model now allows you to study the interplay of Andreev reflection and Kondo effect. Normally, I told you that Andreev reflection is always killed by these Coulomb interactions, but we will see that if we can meet this inequality, so if this hybridization basically T square is less than the condo temperature. If this can be fulfilled, there is a non-trivial interplay, a constructive interplay of this resonant and wave reflection and condo screening. So to see this, we, uh, we do a quantum Brownian motion picture again. So just as before, we do the abelian bosonization. The tunneling terms give you a sign of phi. That's what we had before. The condo terms now, before we had cosine phi j minus phi k. Now because it's SO1m, it's, it's the product of cosines. So if you look at that for m equal 3, you can visualize it as a, as a lattice. So this term here tries to pin the phi's near the sides of a, single a simple cubic lattice. While this term here tends to pin you at the, at the sides of a BCC lattice. Yeah? And in general, it's, it's a superposition of these two, which basically means that this point here will move along the diagonal line. Yeah? If, you, if you superimpose these two, you get a lattice where this point sort of moves along this line. And we will see that this nearest neighbor distance between two minima, that's absolutely crucial for getting the scaling dimension of the leading irrelevant. So we will see that this plays a central role in what follows. Yeah, so because the leading irrelevant operator will come from tunneling transitions between nearest neighbor minima. And so this uh, nearest neighbor distance d, in fact, directly yields the scaling dimension of this leading irrelevant operator according to this expression. It's just d square uh, in units of the lattice spacing uh, over 2 pi square. This was shown in a nice paper by Charlie Kane and his uh, uh, PhD student back then, Hong Mi Yi. So that's a result that was established for quantum Brownian motion, but we can directly use it here in, uh, in this uh, uh, mesoscopic device, so to speak. 
So what you have to do now is you have this uh, lattice. You have an analytical formula how this lattice looks like. So you just have to compute geometrically the distance between these two points in the in the lattice. And uh, and uh, basically that will tell you what is the scaling dimension of the leading irrelevant. So if the leading irrelevant operator has scaling dimension larger than one, it is irrelevant, so the ground state is still stable. So uh, this moving along here basically means that because of resonant Andreev reflection, you basically rotate your condo fixed point. So that's uh, in a sense still a condo, non uh, a non-fermi liquid fixed point, but it's unitarily rotated by resonant Andreev reflection. That changes scaling dimension. Yeah, so we, we get a whole manifold of fixed points that you can smoothly tune by changing uh, uh, s some parameters. And the parameters that span this non this non Fermi liquid manifold are uh, these parameters delta j, which are square root of gamma j, so the hybridization in units of the condo scale. And then uh, this is the formula you get from just this geometric picture. The stable manifold uh, is for y larger than 1. If y is less than 1, so if the gamma j become too big, the standard resonant Andreev reflection scenario applies. Otherwise, you get these non-Fermi liquid power laws, and these also show up in the temperature dependence of the conductance. Okay, so the final few minutes, I will not use my full time, uh, so don't worry. You, you uh, 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 will be devoted to uh, a few remarks on Majorana surface code and you will uh, get a much uh, more elaborate version of this from Stefan in the workshop. So there has been recent interest by several groups on networks of interacting Majorana fermions and one of the driving forces is the possibility to uh, perform topological universal quantum computation. So the, uh, the in fact, probably or perhaps one of the more promising routes to topological quantum computation or quantum computation at all is the surface code ar ar architecture where you encode a logical qubit through many physical qubits and they have a topological protection. You can decouple error detection uh, and perform via classical software. Presently, this is already implemented in very small codes for superconducting qubits so with microwaves and so on. It's cumbersome, relatively complicated, but at present it's the most promising approach, I would say, and probably on the long run uh, this looks pretty good. There's an excellent review-style paper in FISREF A from 2012 by John Martinez and Clark and co-workers. And uh, the basic uh, surface code idea, I, I mean, goes somehow back to this guitar toric code. Uh, which is a two-dimensional, exactly solvable spin one-half model on a square lattice. Yeah? And the aim will be to build something like this for Majorana fermions. So this uh, 2D Tori code, so you have here the dots indicate spins. They sit on the links of this 2D lattice. And now uh, you have vertices. So these are V are all vertices. And now you take around each vertex a star. So for instance, this blue star for that, you define a star operator by taking sigma x operators for each of these spins. So the product of the sigma x operators at this vertex defines this uh, star operator A nu. And then you have plaquettes. For these, you take the set Pauli matrix. So uh, you take the four uh, sigma set matrices that define this plaquette. And now this uh, Tori code Hamiltonian is defined by two coupling constants, JE and JM, for electric and magnetic. And you sum over all the vertices, take these vertex oper or star operators, and you do the same for the plaquettes, yeah? and, and sum over all the plaquette operators. And now this is exactly solvable because all these operators, A, V, and B, P, commute with each other both within each other and with all the others. And moreover, they have eigenvalues plus or minus one. They're just products of Pauli matrices. They can only have eigenvalue plus or minus one, which means you can diagonalize all of these simultaneously. Yeah? 
And uh, in the ground state, assuming that these parameters are positive, uh, all these must, be, uh, must have an eigenvalue plus one. Okay? And the resulting ground state is a highly entangled one. It's, uh, it's in fact a, a ground state that is known to have uh, intrinsic topological order. Yeah? So long-range entanglement. What is meant by that is, uh, according to uh, Venn's definition, that uh, if you put this theory on a surface with a non-trivial genus, like a torus, torus has genus G equal to 1, then the ground state will have a degeneracy 4 to the G. will have degeneracy 4. Yeah, if you just take it on the plane, it is a non-degenerate ground state. It has a gap to the first excited state. Uh, because there you would have to flip one of these uh, uh, star or plaquette operators or, or, or pairs of these, and for that you have to pay the energy Je or Jm. The non-trivial point is now if you wrap it onto some uh, uh, surface of genus G, you get a degeneracy, and the quasi-particle spectrum here are exactly flips of the star operator. You can think of them as electric charges, or you can flip the plaquette operators. These are the dual ones that are magnetic vortices. Individually, these behave like bosons. If you have two such uh, excitations, you can exchange them like a boson, but they have a non-trivial mutual statistics. In fact, they are abelian anions. And uh, the idea is then uh, to play with these abelian anions to uh, do surface uh, code computations. Now, uh, several people have in the past already thought about uh, how one could model uh, or get something like a Kitaev Tori code with uh, Majorana plaquette models. Most recently, Liang Fu uh, has uh, given a quite detailed uh, recipe how, how this could work. They looked at a honeycomb lattice, but I mean, other lattices also work. We, we look at square lattice, in fact. But let's, let's, for the sake of the argument, just stick to their proposal now. So they have a honeycomb lattice. At each side here, they have a Majorana fermion. And they, they uh, study this, this type of plaquette model. And uh, here you have a single coupling constant, U, which can be taken positive. And you sum over all the plaquettes of your honeycomb lattice. And uh, the plaquette operator, OP, here is just defined by the product gamma 1 to gamma 6 of, uh, of a given plaquette. Yeah? Now, all these plaquette operators mutually commute again because they always share two Majoranas, at least, uh, or zero or two, yeah? but an even number, so they commute. They have eigenvalue plus or minus one, so it's very similar to this Kitaev story, and uh, you can therefore find the ground state by simply requiring that all eigenvalues are equal to plus one. You can also check that this has an uh, intrinsic topological order. In fact, they show it's of C2 type. So on a torus, uh, you have a fourfold ground state degeneracy, which indicates uh, intrinsic topological order. On the plane, it's a unique ground state. On a torus, it's fourfold uh, degenerate. You can uh, show that simply by counting degrees of freedom, like what we did for the uh, degeneracy of this Majorana spin. So you look for, uh, uh, on the torus, you have, say, n Majorana uh, bound states. So you have two to the n half dimensional Hilbert space because you can form n half fermions out of this. Each can be occupied or not. So it's two to the n half. But of course, the total parity uh, is conserved because you don't want to add particles to this uh, torus. So there are two to the n half minus one degrees of freedom that you have. But now you also have constraints. Namely, you have here in this honeycomb lattice three elementary units. I mean, the unit cell contains these uh, three patches. Otherwise, so, so with these you can then span the whole lattice without A, a plaquettes touching other A plaquettes. Yeah? But if you look at this, here will be an A plaquette again, here will be one. If you go through this, you see that the A plaquettes already cover the whole lattice. Yeah? So uh, that means... Um, the product over all the OPs is related to the product over all the gammas. So that means there is a constraint for each of these three sublattices. The product of the plaquette operators must be equal to the parity. Yeah? So we have for each A, B, or C type plaquette, 
In fact, 2 to the n over 6 minus 1 ground state con constraints. That's because we have n over 6 uh, plaquettes of type A, for instance. Each can be zero, uh, 1 or minus 1. So we have 2 to the n over 6. And again, we have one constraint, so that, uh, uh, that eliminates half of them. So we get uh, precisely this number for A, B, and C. So we get it to the power 3. So the degrees of freedom are given by the numbers of degrees of freedom we have in principle divided by the number of constraints. And that's just four. Yeah? So it's a very simple way to see that on the torus. <laughs> on the torus. Yeah? So you need Wilson loops to change uh, and so on. And then on top of the ground state, you, you have uh, anion excitations that can be constructed from these elementary plaquette excitations so that you flip one plaquette of A, B, C type, and then you can form composite objects like flip A and B, B and C, A and C, or th three types. In fact, three types uh, just corresponds to a corner shared Majorana operator. And uh, I don't want to go into much detail here, but the elementary excitations turn out to have bosonic self-statistics, but then a periphase pi under exchange of different types. Yeah. It's gapped, yeah. And uh, plaquettes can, in fact, only be flipped in pairs uh, belonging to the same uh, species yeah, in this model. So now the, the question is, of course, how could you realize this Majorana plaquette model experimentally? So Fu makes a, a proposal how to do this on a uh, topological insulator by patterning uh, uh, superconductors and then working with microwave radiation. We believe this is much too complicated. One can do it much simpler. In fact, we work together with an experimentalist from Charlie Marcus group. They believe they can uh, do things like this relatively quickly by using our, uh, these islands as in the topological condo effect. But now you form a network of such islands connected by tunneling contacts. One can show that the resulting model uh, uh, can lead to a plaquette Hamiltonian, which in turn uh, is in fact equivalent to the Kitaev Tori code. So you can show that uh, analytically. And the readout and manipulation of plaquettes can even be done by conductance measurements. So you can bring in additional electrodes and then just by making conductance measurement, in principle at least, you can measure the plaquette value or change it. And uh, again, if you are interested in details, please go and see Stefan's talk uh, in two weeks, I guess. So that's uh, about what I wanted to say. So uh, in this last part, I discussed uh, three more recent developments, namely this spin dynamics uh, near the strong coupling fixed point. Then what happens when you are close to another superconductor with this device, you get a manifold of non-fermi liquid states. Or if you have a whole lattice of these uh, condo impurity spins, you can think of Majorana surface codes, networks of interacting Majorana surface. And with that, I thank you for the attention. I stop a bit earlier, so we can <laughs> not rush to the dinner. Yeah. <laughs>